Cheers. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nava Milliken. I'm the Artistic Director for the Center for Art in Wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have a very, um, very stimulating and um, heavy discourse um, <laughs> event going on tonight, Lessons from a Chair. And um, I'm not going to deliberate uh, too long. I'm going to hand it over to Katie Sorensen in just a moment. But I did want to welcome everybody here today um, and also cover a couple of housekeeping things. So first of all, I wanted to let everyone know that we should have um, subtitles provided if you're hearing impaired and you'd like a simultaneous um, subtitle um, offered for you, you should have um, a CC icon at the bottom of your screen and it says live transcript. If you just click on that, you should have um, subtitles running throughout the event. Um, so that's a wonderful new development for uh, the center's um, online programs. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we're gathered in the unsurrendered ancestral indigenous territory of the Lenni Lenape and Wingo Hawking people who were and continue to be active stewards of these lands. Um, we are holding up indigenous visibility and affirm the sovereignty for individuals and communities who live here now and for those who are forcibly removed from their homelands. The Center for Art and Wood and its staff and board will work to hold the center accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. Um, so thank you everyone for joining me and um, all of us tonight. Katie's going to handle introductions. I will depart, but I just want to let you know that I'll also be moderating the chat um, and any questions that you have throughout the course of the event, Feel free to throw them into the chat and um, we'll get to them when the program allows for questions and I'll moderate. So with that, Katie, take it away. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to tonight's program, which is uh, Lessons from the Chair. Um, I just wanna introduce our four presenters that we um, have with us this evening. I'm very excited to um, have them share um, their thoughts with all of us um, on this very stimulating uh, subject. So I'm going to start with Don Miller, um, who is a good friend of the centers, as well as the three other um, presenters tonight. Is a, He's a Philadelphia-based woodworker and educator, and he holds an MFA in 3D design from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and studied musical instrument design at London College of Furniture, which I find fascinating. After 14 years of teaching at the University of the Arts, um, Miller retired as an associate pr pr professor from craft and material studies. And he um, has participated in residencies in Sweden, South Korea, and has had numerous exhibi exhibitions nationally and internationally. He creates objects both uh, contemplati contemplative and functional working at the intersection of material process and history. Our next um, presenter, which is Mi Kyung Lee, who is also a professor at the University of the Arts uh, of Fibers and Textiles, and she's also the program director of Craft and Material Studies. Uh, she received her BFA from Dong A University in Korea and earned not one, but two MFAs, one in book arts and printmaking from the University of the Arts, but also in fibers from Cranbrook Academy of Arts. Lee has participated in numerous solo exhibitions, lectures, and collaborative projects nationally and internationally. So thank you for being with us tonight. Jung Han Bay is an artist and designer currently based in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, which is very beautiful there. Thanks for joining us from Michigan. Um, <laughs> um, he was born in Seoul and moved to Philadelphia in 2010, where he studied fine art and woodworking at the University of the Arts. And just this past year in 2020, 
He received his MFA in 3D design from Cranbrook Academy of Art. He takes inspiration from nature, man-made structures, and fantasy while playing with the boundaries between form and function. Our last uh, presenter tonight is Nick Flaherty. Um, he is a woodworker, wood turner, and carpenter living in Philadelphia. He attended the fine woodworking program at Bucks County Community College before receiving his BFA from the University of the Arts in 2019. He was in the midst of plotting and seamlessly executing his global takeover when the pandemic halted his plans. So currently he works as a residential carpenter incorporating his fine woodworking skills directly into his client's home. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Don. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, I really appreciate the uh, center for kind of setting this conversation in motion. And um, it's, it's um, wonderful to be a part of the programming for uh, Tom Lozer's show. Tom's um, an important mentor and a great friend. So uh, it's, it's really nice to be doing this. Um, thanks to my colleague, Mei Kyung, and my former students, Jun Han and Nick, for um, rising to the occasion to participate in this and talk about uh, their experience in the wood program at UArts. Um, let's see, I'm going to share my screen. And OK, so lessons from the chair. Um, this is going to be, um, I'm going to do an introductory um, short presentation. We'll hear from Nick and Jun Han and Mick Young. Um, mine will be kind of didactic. Uh, hopefully, it'll loosen up towards the end a little bit. Um, so, um, lessons from the chair. Um, the cultures of chairs is vast. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, it's among the most ancient of human artifacts. And a spark in the human imagination. The chair is what Le Corbusier would have called a machine for living. The object most familiar in the domestic environment. But it's also uh, the core of the home as a place for shelter and respite. The chair is an object that mirrors the user. It's an object with intrinsic meaning and value that allows us to project the personal onto the broadly cultural. It observes, manifests, and preserves memory and history. This is the chair Lincoln was shot in and a photo I got out of the off the um, out of the paper this week of a memorial chair for Jefferson Davis, which was uh, kidnapped and held hostage recently. The chair is home. We learn the world through chairs, and we project ourselves onto them. These should be familiar, but um, the left hand image is. Um, Obama's empty chair from Clint Eastwood's 2012 Republican convention speech. And the image on the right is from the 2020 COVID memorial in Washington. But the chair is also a natural structure, an optimal meeting of materials and forces, not unlike a tree. As such, chairs anchor the beginnings of technology and its persistent advance. The drive towards a practical solution to comfort has led to some very complex solutions. The chair is restless. Um, it is an object that raises holds and expresses questions, problems, tensions, contradictions, and dualities. I like to think that all of the 
relationships or tensions or dualities in the in the list above can be summed up in and in, in a in a deep exploration of turned and joined chairs this kind of essential um relationship between how chairs have been made in history um, as such the chair is a powerful teaching tool uh, its intimacy in our lives provokes the mind to think and the body to act. In the studio classroom, the practice of technically skilled making is paralleled by imagination and interpretation, contemplation and critical conversation. In my own experience um, uh, with chairs is I don't make chairs in my own woodworking practice. Um, the context of my experience has been mostly one uh, of teaching. Um, I repaired chairs at my first woodworking job at Romeo de Rogers cabinet shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 70s. And I made chairs. I helped Tom Lozer make chairs in, uh, in graduate school as his studio assistant. Um, I'm an interior space guy, but essential to my own woodworking development was the balance between immersing myself in a tradition and rebelling against it. Excuse me. I found a home teaching uh, in the UARC's craft and material studies program, attempting to convey the rigor and constraints of skill development while, while questioning it with risk-taking and intuitive making. Chair making requires the ability to relate a broad range of processes and materials. The full semester in our advanced curriculum was dedicated to learning its history, construction, and cultural significance. The rigor of this major coursework was paralleled by the more primary and intuitive approach taken in freshman elective and low-tech furniture. So low-tech furniture, so a class in which students approach the chair as an image to be manipulated deconstructed and reconstructed. Um, this is a series of projects from one, one um, episode in that class from one year, one offering of that class. Over the summer, I gathered junk chairs all over the city. And um, the first project in the fall was to um, do a series of installations uh, around, the, around the campus. Uh, the second project was um, a shadow painting project in which we um, painted shadows of chairs and then made scale models of those paintings. Uh, the third project was uh, I took the chairs that I had initially collected and that we did installations with, tore them apart, auctioned them off, and made a series of Frankenstein chairs that were pretty, pretty great, really. Pretty great, good, good stuff. Uh, and then the final project for each student was to do a, a uh, project of their own devising. Um, Annette made a knitted wearable chair. Liana articulated the space, uh, the negative space in a classic Breuer chair with jute string and added a ponytail. And Leah um, created her for forest throne. Yeah. Uh, freshman electum is a, is a, a broad intro into woodwork and culture and simple processes. Tara Belafato has taught this um, course for several years. Um, she, introduces, uh, she introduces students to wood turning as a discrete uh, project in the realm of woodworking processes and um, along with, wood, with uh, carving, and uh, surface design um, does this great stool project. These are some of the results of that of her class. Introduction to wood was a contact for teaching basic technical processes, material science and history, balancing traditional approaches with individual voices. Um, students tended to bite off more than they could chew in this class, um, but there was often uh, good results. The two images on the right are uh, by students who went on to um, 
to uh, do theses in, in um, wood furniture, and you can kind of predict the, uh, their senior work in this work that they did as sophomores. Um, the junior senior curriculum was one semester dedicated, dedicated exclusively to seating uh, and addressed in most of the other semesters as well. This included in-depth history with a focus on material innovation and processes and, the reflect, and their reflection on changing social patterns. There are two primary projects operating in tandem. Um, an introductory project intended to dismantle assumptions about what a chair should be and how it functions. Given an amount, a limited amount of material students needed to design, test and build the lightest, strongest seating possible, a seating object possible. So um, this is that, it, some images from that experimental chair project. Um, modeling at quarter scale, half scale and full scale, you can see the um, um, limited amount of ash that students were provided for the project. Um, they really needed to think for the first time about how to translate, translate material um, effect effectively into a structural uh, system. Um, and the testing day was always a lot of fun. They had to test, they had to uh, lean back in the chair and it had to support them. Um, unfortunately, there's no, or fortunately, there's no exploding chairs in this image, but yeah. Um, an introductory project, okay, second collaborative project directed uh, students towards the production of a traditional form by traditional means. Um, this was either a Windsor chair or a, a, a Greenwood uh, slat bat uh, chair. The Windsor chair uh, began, the Windsor chair project began by visiting Chris Storb at the Philadelphia Museum of Art for an up close and personal look at some historical chairs. Um, and uh, students were then uh, divided into teams in which they would um, design and fabricate uh, the um, hoop back assembly, uh, the seat, the carved seat assembly, and the turned um, leg assembly, and then would come together and as a group uh, do the final assembly on the chair. Uh, these are two of the examples that came out of those uh, projects, the Tangerine Windsor and the Texas Chainsaw Met Windsor. Yeah. Um, another uh, collaborative project uh, was the Greenwood Chair. Um, this was uh, um, it's a chair from a tree using only hand tools, relying on the selective use in green and dry timber. Um, let's see. Peter Park at Spock Sawmill, knocking out, knocking out parts from a from a uh, oak log. We brought that into school and then um, rived parts, rived uh, components out with axe and maul. These were then shaped uh, with uh, hand tools on a shaving horse. There's Nick and Nick and Will in the workshop shaving away. Uh, those those components were then steamed, formed with steaming, and uh, then you see the finished components and a partial assembly. Um, and the outcomes: me, Will, Scott, and Katie. I had never done this when I taught it. And I, it's one of the most, most valuable teaching experiences was learning along with the students how to do this, trying to stay like 15 minutes ahead of them uh, and including all my failures and all of my exploration and all of my discoveries in the teaching process. And it was really a, a very um, rewarding, I think it's probably the most rewarding um, project I've offered in terms of, of its uh, successfully providing a, a remarkable depth of material experience 
and um, hand workmanship. Um, after these two projects, uh, students would go on to design their own their own pieces um, for the end of the semester, and many of those wound up in the um, senior thesis. So I'd like to move on to look at some of those, um, selection of those. So Michelle Anthony uh, graduated in 2010. This piece, uh, Fight Back, was the center of her thesis exhibition, really addressing a, a kind of combative relationship between people, um, both trying to inhabit the same chair. I and mean, she explored a range of, of um, kind of formal possibilities and possibilities of, of exploring motion uh, for this, um, for this uh, problem as her research, but a uh, really great piece. Um, Tara Enman Belafato uh, graduated in 2009 and then went on to become our um, shop manager and has taught in the program for several years. Um, Tara's thesis project took um, kind of the primary forms of a slap back chair and a ladder back chair deconstructed and manipulated those forms in space, uh, making things which were functional, quasi-functional and totally non-functional. Um, Elliot Brady, whose um, stool, uh, stool you saw in an earlier slide, um, did a really great uh, thesis project based in a kind of material exploration of um, seating surfaces um, using um, sheepskin, ghost skin, uh, a range of woven materials, and including the shelf in the upper in the upper image, which was um, carved to imitate a uh, a woven uh, seat seating surface. Uh, Mark Tijiamo um, graduated in two thousand fourteen. These are both projects that he made in other classes, but that were included in his thesis project. Uh, he made live roots as an exploration of bent lamination in our semester for bending and laminating. And the plated lounge was made in a, um, a sculpture welding class. Uh, Ethan Vio's work um, stems kind of stems back to uh, the making of the experimental chair. This, um, his thesis work continued to explore that lightweight um, kind of optimal use of material, minimal use of joinery to um, make a range of cha chairs which uh, were identical, pretty much identical apart from um, material and um, formal variation. And last but not least, um, uh, Jason O'Brien's double rocker. We saw his double double uh, shaker bench in an earlier slide, and he carried that through with a, a uh, translation of this um, classic shaker, uh, shaker rocking chair um, into a double rocker. Um, Scott Newman, again, this, this piece uh, derives from Scott's uh, making the slapback chair. Uh, those chairs had um, we use shaker tape for the most part for those chairs for those chairs woven chair seats. Um, Scott took that that material and process and and um, uh, interpreted into a, a range of of other forms. Uh, this is a tall cabinet, Sister June Carpenter, and uh, I think he also made a doghouse and a. Um, and a, an outhouse that were that use shaker tape to articulate space. And finally, Colin Pisano's great uh, chair um, manipulating his wild personifications of furniture objects that were his great 2014 thesis project. Good. Um, so thank you. That's what I've got. And I'm going to hand it over to Jun Hong. Oh, thanks, Katie. 
let's see. Am I doing it right? Yeah. Hello everyone. My name is Jung Han Bae, and I'm one of I'm one of Don's former student at University of the Arts. At UArts Wood program, my last two year consists of four semesters, which are handwork, bending and lamination, case, and chair. Today I'm going to talk about the projects for chair semester that became part of my thesis work. The chair semester started with simple physics study. Every single piece of furniture deals with human interaction and the forces such as gravity. The chair really actively engages with our body every day. Our weight, constantly changing center of gravity due to our movement becomes stressed to the chairs. We did lots of structure tests with simple thin pieces of wood and study how that structure receives force and how it reacts and how to counter that force. And we were asked to make lots of small scale models of chair made of bamboo skewer and hot glue. When the class gathered with a bunch of models, we discussed about the design structure and we tested them with a finger by gently pressing and shaking them. Some of them could not handle the pressure from the finger and broke, but some of them were strong and survived. So we studied them to find out what structural decision made them successfully go through the test. Then we got our first assignment. Small piece of ash that is about 36 inch long, four inch wide, and two inch thickness was given to the each student. Everyone had to build a chair only using that piece of ash, which was not a lot of material. We were going to test the chair after we build it, so it must be strong enough to make it through. Out of all the small scale models that I made and survived, I decided to make the one that has crossed arch that diagonally connects the four legs. On the model, the arch directly supports the weight from the above. I was thinking that it would create triangulation that counters the force that applies back and forth and side to side. Imagine someone leaning back and make a chair stand with just two legs at the back, which I do it all the time, habitually. When I started to plan out full scale, I realized I wouldn't have enough wood. So I started to subtract some parts. Even after I took lots of parts away and leave the minimum part that requires to be a chair, I still wouldn't have enough wood. So I took another architectural invention followed by the arch. I beam. I love man-made structure, something like a skeleton of a building, especially when they were in the process of construction. My dad is an architect and engineer, and he sometimes took me to his workplace when I was a child. His workplaces were always some temporary offices next to some construction site for big, tall buildings and I was able to see the whole site from there. It was something like this. Imagine how cool a construction site can be to a nine-year-old boy. The holes bigger than and bigger and deeper than a house, huge construction machines and vehicles, insanely tall tower cranes, steel and concrete structures. These all make me really excited. Ivy makes a skeleton of building structure and it makes the building lighter, stronger, and taller. We wouldn't have skylines if I beam wasn't invented. It also saves lots of material as it requires three thin layers, three thin elements, two horizontal flanges and one vertical web. By constructing wooden I beam, I finally had barely enough material to make the chair full size. This is the first chair that I made out of that piece of ash. Sid did not have to be a part of that ash. Wooden I-beam parts were really light, so I wanted to make the seat light as well. So I used the minimum amount of leather strap to have cross with seat. However, this decision made the arch much less effective. 
I had to lower the arch because, because the whipped seat would be sagging. Otherwise, it would be some sort of a medieval torture chair. Unlike my original model, the cross arch would not support the weight of a person anymore, but I thought it would still create triangulation between the legs, resisting multi-directional forces. When the chair was done and tested, I found out the arch did not distribute the force and the joints that connect the rear leg to the apron took a lot of stress. The joints did not fail immediately, but I knew if I keep leaning back, it was only a matter of time. I did not want the arch to be just a decorative element. I wanted to be work as it's supposed to be. So I gave up on the weaved seat and decided to go with a with solid seat. That way, arch would be attached to the seat, resisting to the weight and multi-directional force. If I cover the entire seating surface with a solid seat, the arch would be hidden and I didn't want that. So I went with grid so that it can be see-through. Grid is also a man-made system and structure that I really like because I think it is one of the most logical thing we've ever invented. It is how we determine and divide the space, how we navigate, and how we measure. It is an order and control. It is a one way that we understand the world. Grid also resembles to us and our, our society. It consists of small individual rectangles or cubes that becomes something much bigger and much stronger. I feel like I was, I was a little bit too obsessed with the technical detail of this piece when I was making them. It was a good challenge to figure out how the arches would meet the legs and the grid. But now that I look back, a lot of things are off aesthetically and proportionally. And the idea about the crossing arch becoming a part of triangulation still didn't work. The arch connected to the, the center of the seat and gets, when I lean back, it gets twist force when, and which the arch is not a good uh, structure to resist that. I finally realized that I need a proper triangulation that supports apron and the rear legs. So I made this third chair and it was a rocking chair. I got rid of the center arch and it and added sections of arch on each corner. This way it would pro properly distribute the weight from the aprons, which holds the seat and finally create tr proper triangulation for back and forth side to side forces. The rockers and the stretchers on the bottom also helps stabilizing the entire structure. The back spindle idea was from our previous collaborative winter chair project. All the majors had to participate. Some students worked on the turned legs and the stretcher. Some of us carved the seat, and some, including me, made the steam bent loop and the back spindles. The challenge of my part was to align the spindle holes on the loop and the seat. As you can see, the back spindles spread out multi direction like like a fan. We've seen when skilled woodworkers drill that holes, they just aim it with their eyes and drill it successfully. But we want it more collaborative, sorry, controllable way. So we used a very simple jig that Don invented. It was a long jig that sandwiched the loop, placing the loop in the middle of the jig. The bottom has a pin that points the center of, of bottom hole like a compass, and the top has pre-drilled pre -drilled hole, so it guides the drill bit to the loop exactly the angle we want. I used the same jig installed the spindle on my rocking chair. I'm not really a big fan of Windsor chair, but two things that I love about Windsor are its spindles and the back spindles and carved seat. Each, each spindle is thin and weak, but when they are together, they are strong enough to hold a body weight. They are also very light and flexible, which makes the sitting very comfortable. Going back to my rocking chair, 
I wanted to use the Windsor scarf seat on my rocking chair, but it is just too heavy. I made all the other parts as light as possible, so it didn't make sense to have inch and half thickness solid wood as a seat. Weaving the seat would, would have made the chair the lightest, but it was not possible because of the arches and the spindles. I could probably find the weird uh, weaving way to, to make it happen, but with, it would have been bad aesthetically. I also wanted to emphasize the triangular void where three arches meet. So I went with a rounded upholstered seat using three eight inch thickness plywood. The experimental chair project gave me an opportunity to think about man-made structure and its rich history. From cave to the skyscrapers, I cannot even imagine how difficult it was for us to get here. The structures we built imposed their presence against the nature while physically defining the culture. They convey the beauty of human mind and reason as cumulative human knowledge. When my dad was showing me the construction sites, my heart was filled with emotion. I was too young and I did not understand what it was back then. It was a pride that I am a part of human being capable of making something great, capable of going forward and capable of asking questions and finding the answer. And finally, capable of passing that legacy to the next generations. I would like to end my presentation with an engraved quote that I found on the wall of Detroit Public Library. Civilization is the accumulated culture of mankind. Thank you. Now I'm gonna hand over the presentation to Nick. Thanks, Jun Han. Um, and let me just get set up here. Um, uh, and thank you for the center for having us here uh, tonight. My name is Nick Flaherty, and um, I was a student of Don several years ago. I graduated from the Wood program at UArts, and um, I'll just take you through my journey with chairs here and how my whole woodworking practice uh, was sort of transformed by the um, chair building semester class with that I had with Don and, and how that's uh, changed everything. But before I do that, I just wanted to say that uh, Don retired uh, right after the pandemic hit and was uh, very sort of unceremoniously uh, just uh, just left UArts. And um, so I just wanted to use this opportunity to say uh, thank you for everything that you did at UArts and congratulations on a, a job well done. Um, so with that, I will get started. Um, so this was the first chair that I ever made, not long after I got into woodworking. Um, I've always been a fan of Matisse, and I think I went to the Mad or the MoMA or something, and I saw this painting, and I thought, oh, I can make that chair. And so I, um, I think I was in a conceptual furniture making class at um, Bucks County Community College at the time. So uh, I thought, this is, this is perfect. So I made this chair, and I made it 2D, just like in the Matisse painting. And uh, I think it's the only thing that could fit in my apartment at the time anyway. Um, the second chair that I made was, um, uh, I spent about a month designing it and it was just, uh, uh, I really wanted to challenge myself technically thinking that that's uh, what made uh, a good woodworker was being able to technically do anything um, like compound double, uh, mortise and tenons, compound angle double mortise and tenons, um, and just all these really sort of extreme joints and uh, crazy joinery, and uh, and with you know without giving much thought to the uh, the design of it, I was just much more focused on the technical aspect of it. Um, so I got it to this point, uh, having achieved all of those all of those technical goals, the compound angle double mortise and tenons and all that crazy stuff. And um, this is how it is now. I haven't even finished it because I think I just got, got out of it what I wanted. 
Um, and then uh, this was the first semester I had with Don was this, this class um, where we were given the two by four by 36 block of ash to make a chair out of. And no, we couldn't use any screws uh, or nails and it had to support Don uh, at the very end. And I wanted to try to design something that wasn't a traditional looking chair. It didn't just have four legs and a, you know, a seat in the back. I wanted to try to uh, technically challenge myself again. So I designed this and um, it, it worked for not very long. And then one of the pieces fell out and it sort of, it sort of crumbled. But um, again, my sort of obsession at that point was very much on the technical side of things. Um, and, uh, you know, just sort of using that, that side of my brain um, until finally we got to the slapback chair where um, my relationship with wood really changed. Um, it was, I have a friend who always says there's, there's three different kinds of uh, woodworkers. There's uh, cabinet makers, that is to say, people who, uh, you know, mostly work with uh, milled wood, joined wood, you know, rectangular wood. Um, and then you've got wood turners who, you know, work on the lathe. And you've got wood carvers, and each one of them can have like a very different relationship uh, to the wood and how you interact with it and how it responds to the tools and how that feels in your hands, what, what, that, what that really feels like in your hands. And up until this point, I really didn't have much experience with, with the third kind, the carving, um, carving aspect of wood and really having a, a tactile uh, understanding of the wood and the wood grain um, and just that really intimate connection with the material. And this project really allowed me to get into that and um, sink into like a very sort of meditative place with the wood. The whole process of making this chair is, uh, you know, we did it with no power tools whatsoever. So it was just entirely done by hand in the bench room um, with uh, froze and shaving horses and malls and spoke shaves. And, um, and it really just allowed me to get so much closer to the wood and the, and the material in, in like a really meditative and important way that was lacking from my practice uh, up until this point, I think. Um, and uh, the history of it was also important too, you know, that this was something that was, uh, you know, that had been being done for hundreds of years. People have been making this chair just like this um, because the process is just as simple and as beautiful as it as it could be you know there's just no way to really improve on the process uh, and there was something really beautiful about that being the case with a room full of you know fifty thousand dollars worth of fancy equipment uh, right next door that this was just as simple and pure as it could get um, so from that point I, um, I I've you know a lot of my practice has um, then about making stools like this, very sort of similar to that process, but trying to incorporate my own vocabulary and my own aesthetic and um, put my own sort of voice in there. And this is something that I'm continuing to do regularly. Um, and I sometimes use the spoke shave and just the hand tools, and sometimes I don't, but it still allows me to get into a very sort of meditative practice with the with the wood when I'm making you know a batch of stools or something like that. Um, uh, I also one thing I really uh, took away from that chair process was that was this sort of was just sinking into the material, and um, so moving away from chairs, I still felt this urge to really just sink into a material and make. 500 of something and sit down and work on that thing and just sort of get lost in the, uh, the, the process of all that rather than designing something on a piece of paper and going into a room with all of the tools and the machines, um, you know, just sort of sitting down at a bench or at a, at a desk and just getting lost in, in the process of making 500 
of these cubes and painting them and sanding them and, um, and finding a way to arrange them. Um, and then this was, uh, that last piece, sorry, this is about four feet long and one foot tall or five feet long, something like that. Um, this is uh, something sort of similar to that, but um, made with uh, Western yellow cedar that's been split uh, using the fro, which was the tool uh, that I became familiar with with the slap back chair process. Um, again, just sort of getting lost in the whole process of this and getting intimately related with the material um, and creating these sort of brick-like forms that are split pieces of wood that are sort of like fingerprints. Each one has its own unique sort of personality. And this is about six feet by three feet. Um, this is something I made for my thesis project, which is sort of a combination of the two worlds or the two sort of sides of your brain, if you will. There's the sort of complex designed uh, cabinet maker side in there and figuring out how this would all work and be a functional table. Um, and then there's also the uh, sort of spontaneity um, that came with making the legs and, um, and the freedom that came along with that, which was something that uh, uh, again, I learned from the slapback chair process. And this is my most recent piece, which um, was made uh, for the um, AAW auction last summer. And this is six inches by six inches by six inches. It fits in a, it would fit in a six inch cube. Um, so each one of these little stool forms is reminiscent of the shaker stools and the legs are about a quarter inch and the rungs are about an eighth of an inch. And again, I just, uh, you know, turned 500 little pieces on the lathe and um, stuck them all together into this giant, well, tiny, tiny little uh, glob of, uh, of, of stools. Um, the prompt for this project was uh, nature nurture, which got me thinking about compulsion, things that you, uh, that, you know, um, you can't help yourself from doing and people, you know, frequently ask why does somebody have a compulsion? Is it nature or nurture? And this was what I found myself needing to make this compulsion to just make all these little processes, these little, these little pieces um, using this process um, and the vocabulary sort of, if you will, that I learned from the uh, slapback chair process. And um, that's it. And with that, I will uh, pass it off to Meek Young. Thank you, Nick. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen, everybody. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Anava and Katie from Center to organize this event. and. Uh, I'd like to thank Don Miller, my dear colleague, who invited me to join for this, uh, this presentation and panel discussion. So uh, in my short presentation, I would like to share with you a few of the uh, fibers and textile you know, program students work that are connected to uh, chair as um, you know, not only material uh, and process, but also part of a content and metaphor. So I'd like to start with the uh, Ashrid Buccio, student who graduated in 2010. And as you know, many of the students in Fiber's textile program has been heavily focused uh, on material and process driven approach. Uh, and so this student who was a senior and her deep investigation was about you know, daily routine material. She really wanted to kind of uh, really find the cycle of life. So, her process was everything grinding, you know, so including her hair, uh, even fabric, even pencil, or even um, cup, or even tea bags, everything is all kind of, you know, grinded. So starting from object to dust. So this particular work is a found chair from street. And then she really grinded until the chair become bone remain. And so it, it was really amazing to see this kind of a transformation. Um, and the next image is about Liz Reed, a student who graduated last year. This is her sophomore year project with the Warren Silly crew had about constructed circus class. 
And this particular coiling process she applied onto her home, uh, you know, chair that broken. And it's got kind of process of this um, coiling as in a way binding and kind of really bring the memory and kind of re-identify the, the chair. So these are some of other, the images you can see. And this is her junior year project that applies uh, also, again, you know, domestic chair. And she repurposed it and with the upholstery process, <clears throat> even, you know, tapestries and coiling and wrapping. And she really gives a kind of a new textures, new identity to the existing chair. And this is a kind of really interesting project, Carolyn Anello, uh, we, she applied for a site specific project. And this is actually kind of really old, the beat up, uh, you know, uh, chair. You can see on the left here, there's a little cigarette kind of uh, buzz outside of our kind of, you know, outdoor ceramic studios. And so what she did was she was using pantyhose to kind of cover the chair, kind of really give a, you know, new, um, uh, new identity, and you can see some of the details. So, so that is a kind of a um, very exciting way to see this kind of you know existing objects, how the students transform uh, their identities. So this is also the project that we did uh, work on the library as a site specific connection with the sites and objects. So John Leakey, um, you can see the center. The students are kind of surrounded this library. <clears throat> at the university, it's a quiet space, and uh, she he really wanted to give this kind of a really blunt color and uh, you know uh, chair that constructed here in this particular site location. Uh, I think this is a really amazing uh, way to see it because it, this is solid. He constructed everything, and uh, that was really learning about a poetry process, but. You know, next a couple of uh, uh, two students' examples along with the John was that, you know, the program really stretched not only offering fiber textile courses, students also started with the Don about the woodworking, you know, low tech furnitures. They're really able to kind of in a way cross disciplinary into crafts medium. So that was kind of a really good example to see uh, John's work growing in this kind of a connection with the fibers, textile, and, you know, wood and furniture. So this is uh, somehow our kind of uh, loud but quiet discussion at the library. So next two examples of uh, the students a similar way. This is a um, Paige Fashion, who's one of the faculty member. I think she's in a way uh, initiated really good, you know, bridge between fibers textile and uh, wood and furniture. And I think these students are for chair is a really kind of in a way uh, bring deep association with um, the landscape of a home and also memory of their family history. And this kind of furniture and particularly when chairs are kind of really deeply connected to it. So uh, this is uh, her thesis uh, work that she really kind of, you know, constructed bottom to top and really kind of, you know, uh, re-identify the objects that she, she remembers at the home. And Olivia Jones in her uh, senior year also, she was really pushing memories of her home and she was really kind of pushing the upholstery process. So she was using some objects and the construction, working also uh, with the Don, you know, pushing that connection with the fibers and textile furniture. And so this is a, some of the earlier work that she started as a thesis project. And then this is a really kind of, you know, wonderful way of uh, finding this existing furniture and she kind of uh, constructed with this upholstery uh, to kind of uh, give identity, re-identify what object and the connection with the seating and the relationships. So, so in a way, uh, Olivia was one of really important role to continue influence to uh, our students, uh, actually Paige Fashion and Olivia Jones. Because actually Olivia, after she graduated, <clears throat> she went to uh, UPenn sculpture program and then joining back to us uh, past six years, she's been teaching you know, a poetry program, a poetry class with us. So this is our studio, the st students each finding you know, furniture and then they try to repurpose those uh, process of poetry into their work. 
So far left, this is Olivia Jones. <coughs> So some of the examples for uh, you know next couple of slides are the influence from this particular poetry class. Uh, as I said earlier, you know fibers and textile students really influenced by material and process. This is Adalia Firun who graduated two years ago. This is one of her early uh, work that she did with the um, a poetry class. So this is a found you know particular chair, but she was a giving. <clears throat> this kind of really uh, narratives of the imagery with the branches, the local branches that should really kind of be purposing onto the chair is almost kind of uh, uh, graphic imagery, imagery. Next couple of images are from Basha Jones who has a biracial uh, you know, history in her family. And she really tried to find uh, some of the uh, memory in this kind of uh, chairs and you know, domestic landscape with her identity. So this is kind of very old chair from home and she kind of uh, brings it into her own narratives of story. So in the back, it's all kind of, you know, uh, woven into this kind of hair as a kind of uh, the imagery as a, you know, half black and half white. And this is a continuous of uh, her kind of finding the imagery of her home and uh, you know, just kind of constructing this kind of uh, um, the furniture. And this is also, you know, found a particular uh, sofa that she was kind of repurposing it, and uh, you know, using really a pottery process and using a fur. She was using a lot of black and white to kind of really bring that kind of identity issues uh, with this kind of uh, application. So this is the detail. And this is also kind of to me very touching project that I really enjoyed. This is actually very um, uh, kind of in a more personal way. She's not really applying chair as a physical, you know, sitting chair. This is a more kind of in a way metaphor, you know, how this, um, the format of uh, the sitting it kind of tying with this kind of particular wall. So this is our crit space. She was using uh, all this kind of recycling, um, you know, wrapping cloth, and she kind of really bound it, you know, just uh, wrapping and wrapping and tied with the existing wall. And that is a kind of become in a way sitting uh, mechanism, but more like think of bring the, the personal uh, agonies and you know, difficulties as a kind of uh, expression rather than just really sitting chair. It looks like a rag, it's kind of wrapping, it almost looks like a body. Uh, so, so this is actually one of my last uh, you know, students uh, work. Uh, Manuela Benign, a student from Venezuela who graduated two years ago, also pushing uh, you know, a lot of uh, domestic objects and working with it. But particularly this piece was really exciting. She had a body cast, uh, her body with uh, uh, rubber. And it was really intensely kind of, uh, you know, photographic, but she was using this uh, found chair embedded her kind of cast the body as a kind of, you know, um, not so much as a furniture, but in a way reflection herself or even chair become in a way body or uh, even person itself. So you can see some of the details uh, of the, the work, but you know, I think that uh, this is a, uh, my last image. Uh, what I like to kind of emphasize on my uh, short presentation is that, the, again, the students are really pushing their emotional uh, and personal kind of narr narratives uh, connected with a chair or furniture. And I think that that, was, that has been very, um, that has been very interesting. And I think that Don's influence in the past, you know, really working with uh, accepting and kind of, you know, um, the approaching a larger scope of a chair, not so much limited to uh, just only technical part, or the functional part of a chair. So, so I'd like to kind of wrap up and thanking Don uh, to influence us so much to our students. Thank you, everyone. Don, I know that you wanted to- Katie. Oh. Hi, I know that you wanted to wrap up with some words of wisdom or kind of- well, I don't have any words of wisdom. They're more like- Thinking a little more about the subject of 
the yeah, teacher well, and the lessons part, we've learned? Yeah, part of the reason I was interested in this was um, I got really interested in it when I thought, when I um, decided to ask Mick Young to participate, um, because I knew that that would um, present the other, you know, very exciting parallel um, uh, kind of role of the of the chair in our education in in uh, craft and material studies at U Arts, and um, you know that it's it's very interesting that the, the students in my presentation and the students in her presentation were um, colleagues. You know, they they went to school together and they critiqued each other other's work, and I think they understand each other's work, and yet they were making very very different work, and. I think it, it presents to me the, the kind of rub between the identity of those of us, that for those of us involved with furniture, that the, the kind of rub between the identity of, of a chair as an object of technology and use, and its identity as an object of memory and metaphor. And, the, and, and you know, trying to get to that rub is, is where so much exciting work happens and and um for me i know in my own practice it's where it's where i try to be and it's a very restless place as i said i mean that restlessness of the chair that i tried to describe is all about that either or you know the dualities that it represents and um and i just like to thank uh junhan and nick and um for their presentations and for being great students and hanging out and, and for me Kim for being such an incredible colleague for 14 years and working together on on uh, this this project of of uh, you know teaching the chair lessons learning lessons from the chair so that's it okay <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. I actually, um, I have a question and then I, again, encourage um, anyone with a question to just type it into the chat. Um, John, I, well, I guess this is, this is for everybody. Um, if you look at the history of furniture, at least in the last 500 years, we have different techniques um, devoted to not only um, Healing with the structure support stability of the chair and um, the ways that it is meant to um, accommodate the human body. But up until the 20th century, we also had ornament and decoration as a way of expressing identity or some kind of social um, rank or, or identity um, or connection. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the role of ornament and um, the future of chairs and whether there is any intersection. Oh. Well, I think that uh, oh, I'm, I'm muted. Okay. Um, you know, I think that uh, obviously, you know, the industrial production of chairs is going towards um, uh, technological efficiency and broad worldwide distribution and all that. But I think, you know, you look at what um, consists of contemporary design and um, it's really going both directions. I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of energy um, put into trying to recreate the imagery of traditional chairs and contemporary design um, based on familiarity. Um, you know, I'm a real formalist. I mean, I, I, I know that the role of ornament, that the role of ornament in, in furniture is um, sort of like, I got exhausted, Victorians exhausted me on it, you know? And um, so, but, but I think it's it's you know there's so many there's so many paths open for, even with a particularly with a chair there's so many pathways open for meaning um, that it's it, it, and, it, and and I hope that all those can continue to be explored both in image and also in how chairs are 
created. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the making of a chair. I mean, we, you know, we teach, we teach um, CNC fabrication and there's, there was a chair project in there, which I didn't document, but, um, and we teach making it with nothing, you know, with a couple hunks of steel and, um, uh, and, and the, the, the play between that, that, those two forms of knowledge is um, what I hope the future will be, you know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I would like to share a question that was um, contributed by Scott Newman, um, also an alumni of the program. Um, Scott asks for Mi Kyung and Don, have you felt that your students have affected your own work? And um, if so, how? Well, that, that might be a loaded question for Don, but I'll let you guys take it. Don, would you like to go first? Oh, sure. Um, okay, Scott. Of course. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole nother presentation, I think. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, I tried to allude to that in the fact that I'm, you know, I'm not a chair maker. I'm not really that interested in making chairs. I haven't made any chairs in my own practice, but chairs lie at the, at the core of my teaching practice, you know, because I think it's, a, it's an object which is in, in, innately, is, which is innately social. Um, it lends itself to collaboration wonderfully because of the, the, the different kind of processes and components and parts that are involved in it. Um, it brought, you know, making the chair brought people together. And also I hadn't really made either a Windsor chair or a slapback chair before I taught it, as I mentioned. And, um, the, 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 the Greenwood chair particularly, I mean, I, mean, I second everything Mick said. I mean, I've been a woodworker for almost 15 years and I've never experienced anything like that. And not just about the material, but the process. I mean, you throw out um, quantifiable measurement, you throw it out and everything is done with a level, a line and a straight edge. And it's just a miraculous way of working. And, and I learned that um, in collaboration with my students. And it's one of my most valuable lessons. But, you know, beyond that, it's a really big conversation, you know? Yeah. So thanks for the question, Scott. So for me too, it's yes. Um, definitely, I think that my per particular, my personal body of work has been influenced by not so much a student uh, specifically, but more it's like a, what I've been teaching. It's more the process of textile, process of fibers. And I think that the specific process has been really uh, important influence past 10 years of my body of work because it talks about the beauty of a labor and you know how actually kind of the connection to um, the process itself. It's like a metaphor become uh, part of my content of work. So, so I think that that's uh, the teaching fiber textile has been heavily influenced. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you both. I think, um, oh, somebody is asking um, who's, who among you um, could volunteer your favorite company? Um, I guess I, I assume this to mean fabrication um, companies or designers who make chairs. I don't know. I still love Eames chair. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mine's got no name, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's the nameless, you know, the, what is it? The unknown craftsman. I think, you know, I mean, I like all kinds of things. I love those. I love that Dorothea Tanning chair, like crazy. That's that's another one. That Dorothea Tanning chair drives me nuts, but um, I would have to be the unknown craftsman. I love those generic things. Nick and Junghai, you do you also have a favorite chair for us? 
Hey, elastic chair. Can you help me out here, Don? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, that that one. Uh, what, what's it, what's the maker's name? Sam Gregg. Samuel Sam Gregg. Gregg. Yeah, Samuel, Samuel Gregg's Gregg. elastic chair is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the the rocking Jun Han's rocking chair is like marvelous. That thing. The pictures don't really do it justice. That thing weighs like half a pound <laughs> and it's and it's beautiful and it's comfortable and it's got these little parts underneath the arms that's like a tactile uh feely thing um i think honestly that might be one of my one of my favorite chairs uh, aside from that i i'm on the spot i couldn't i can't really think of uh, i'm sure i'm sure Thank there's you, lots Nate. but yeah what an honor <laughs> Now you're supposed to say that about my chairs. <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. Um, we have a comment from Chris Dorp, um, that, and he's he's um, mentioning the excitement and engagement when um, the students from the program um, had access to historic furniture when they visited the museum. So, hi, Chris. Nice to see you here. Yeah, and that was really a, a, a turnaround in the students' consciousness. You know, they would go, oh, we got to go to the PMA. We got to look at old stuff. And, you know, Chris would, and just the way Chris would uh, handle it, you know, it, it was so really up close and personal, you know, we looked at the bottoms of things and we could handle things and they were transfixed. You know, their assumptions about, how to interact with something old and the value of interacting with something old was just blown out of the water. We'd go there for our, um, when we do a cabinetry semester too, and I think we, several times, we had taken um, students to visit Chris in his workshop. And there was always this um, uh, uh, desk in there with all these hidden compartments. And they were just like totally, transfixed, you couldn't pry them away from it. So I think that's a really important um, opening in students' consciousness to the kind of continuum of value that, 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 um, that and, the, and the multitude of contexts that um, furniture presents. And, and it was also a doorway into um, being able to uh, impart an appreciation of of social meaning, you know, because it, it sort of manifested all of that social behavior, being able to communicate it. So thanks, Chris. Those are really, those are great moments. <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, connection with the, the history, it's, I think it's really important for the young students. You know, I think of giving the, the history of the past. And I think that um, sometimes you think that you know everything, but you know, going to the museums or you know, parts where you were not exist and just really kind of reconnect with those objects and kind of give a new meaning to connect. I think that that's really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, okay, so we're gonna, we're, we have two more questions and then we're going to um, say goodbye because we have some people who need to be somewhere. So first of all, um, and this is open to everyone, um, what was the first chair that you remember sitting in, um, <laughs> if you, if there is such a relationship um, in your memory? And then the second one is, um, what kind of chairs do you like to sit in, and are they different or similar to what appeals to you visually um, or materially, structurally, um, in terms of your roles as designers, makers, and artists? Anybody? Oh, I don't. I can't remember specifically what the first chair that I uh, that I sat in was, but I know um, this reminds me that Kim Winkle, the furniture maker, Kim Winkle makes. Uh, I don't know if she still does, but she used to make furniture for kids, and uh, she always she said she did it because she doesn't need to think about ergonomics at all because kids never <laughs> sit still long enough for that to really make a difference. And I always thought that's really great that sounds like a really wonderful thing to do and i don't know if there's a big market for 
uh, you know, custom furniture for kids. I could imagine there's not. And I was raised. Uh, there definitely yeah. is. No, oh, custom maybe yoga I, furniture for kids. Maybe I, need to, maybe I need to tap into that market. Yeah. Kinder um, Modern in New York. Yeah. Well, I um, I do have a very specific memory, and it's one of my oldest memories. And it, it's of a, we lived in Southern California when my dad was in the, when my dad was in the Marines at Camp Pendleton in San Diego. And my mother had bought this little Mexican chair. It's like a, with a raffia seat and, you know, super cheap, turned, turned things, it was tiny and um, painted red, you know, very brightly painted. And I remember pulling myself up on it. And it's one of my primary metaphor, not, not metaphors, my primary connections to the, to how we learn to navigate the world through furniture is my memory of pulling myself up, learning to stand by using a chair to support myself, you know? And it's, it's in there. It's like really old, it's in there, you know? That's an old memory, you know? Yeah. The one thing, you know, I can share is that, you know, I don't really have very specific uh, chair. I mean, I, I, I love uh, chair that has, aesthetically pleasing and really kind of amazing and designer chairs was really, really wonderful but uh if i looking back uh you know furniture that i feel very connected to uh in my memory vividly and inspire inspiring you know kind of object was that uh when i was very young you know it's a village where a grandmother uh living this kind of really uh, primitive uh there's no really furniture back in like a 70s in that small little village but they lived, um, they had a really large, like a bamboo kind of um, outdoor, uh, like a kind of table. Actually, you just sit there and then you eat lunch or dinner or you have like, you know, fire, uh, just kind of gatherings there. So that particular large kind of communal, very inviting, um, like kind of table, chair, desk, I mean, whatever it could be. Uh, I even slept there overnight uh, in the summer you know, with the vampire and you're looking at sky. So I don't know, it was about that, that kind of really comfort and aging and loving and like, you know, always a gathering. I don't know, that was just a very vivid, you know, particular object that I always remember. Um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone. Um, oh, second question, second question. Okay. Second question. Okay. I'm sitting on it now. <laughs> yep. That's my favorite chair. Anyway, okay. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. Gina writes, bravo. She was the author. <laughs> um, well, thank Jung you. Han, for, oh. Real quick, I think Jung Han was about to say something and then we just Cut about. So I just want. I just want to uh, give him an. Sorry, Jun Han. Sorry, Jun Han. Um, so the first chair that I remember that I was sitting in was a kind of a, like you know little kids chair. Doesn't have any carved seat. It's just like a flat, well, probably made out of plywood, but you know kind of like fun shapes and colors. Um, and I hated those. It was just uncomfortable. Like Nick mentioned that, you know, kids never want to sit in their own, you know, like adults, they would always, you know, play around and stuff. But I just hated that, that chair. And when I was, uh, I grew up enough to to sit on like a, a proper dining chair that has upholstered. It was such a relief for me. <laughs> yeah. No chair discussion would be a finished without a coming of age story. <laughs> um, well, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. This has um, been a really fun discussion and um, there are so many things that, that I could say, um, but I think we've, we've covered it, Don. Your legacy will um, definitely continue on in the lives of so many makers and um, creatives and designers and artists. And um, anyway, um, we'll continue to see you around and I'm excited to see what's happening in the next chapter of you and your own work. And um, 
So um, with that, I want to um, welcome and invite everyone to um, our event next week, same time, same place. Um, we will be celebrating and um, highlighting this year's winner of the Bob Stocksdale International Excellence in Wood Award. This is a big event for us, um, and it's held in conjunction with Winter Tour, um, Museums, Library, and Gardens, and you won't want to miss that one. So um, I'll just sign off by saying thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mikian. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Jung Han, for uh, um, educating us about chairs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. See you all. Bye, everyone. Bye. Be safe. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.